Well, we're in Birktown, yeah. in north eastern Queensland, northwestern north -western Queensland. Um, Northwest Queensland, golf country. In golf country, with Richard Martin. Well, Richard, um, tell us a little bit about the research that you're doing up here in the golf country. Okay, well, I uh, am researching uh, across the Gulf country with uh, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people uh, looking at a number of issues, but I'm particularly interested in what indigeneity means within this society today. So how Aboriginal people feel about their, their uh, cultures and traditions, which is, as we've heard and we've discussed with people this week, um, date back in this region many thousands of years and, and are continuing in a recognisable form into the present um, and into contemporary lives which are, which, are, which are just as complicated as people's lives in Brisbane or in Sydney or, or anywhere else uh, today. Uh, but also interested in how the idea of indigeneity uh, resonates um, or relates to the experiences of the broader population of the Gulf country. So people with ancestries that include forebears of Chinese descent, mm -hmm. uh, forebears, uh, European forebears, settler uh, histories, people who came into this country uh, as pastoralists, um, and in, in the whole range of professions and occupations that people, people undertake today. So what indigeneity, this powerful uh, international concept, how it relates and articulates with the contemporary life and politics of the Gulf country? I guess my first question is, how do you define indigeneity then? <laughs> because it is such an, a big concept uh, used around the world. And if you maybe can tell us what sort of working definition you use and also how it relates to Aboriginality or, you know, Indigenous Aboriginal. Okay. What, what's that relationship? <laughs> well, I think that, um, that Indigeneity is a, is a concept that, that has arisen internationally in the last uh, few decades to, to describe and relate the experiences of, of people uh, particularly in settler societies or you might call them post-settler societies where where a colonial presence has been felt and in Australia is still felt in in people's lives. So the experiences of and the identities of those who define themselves in relation, I think particularly to that colonial experience. So in the Gulf country today, Aboriginal people are Gungalita people, Wanyu people, Garawa people who've lived here for, for many thousands of years and then have had to deal with this encounter with, with non-Aboriginal people, with settlers, uh, which has shaped and reshaped their identities um, into, into the present. Is, is it fair to say that the intervention of Western colonialism in, in settler societies such as Australia was of a different nature or of a different magnitude than previous interventions between Aboriginal groups or um, by other, because European settlers weren't the first people um, to encounter Aboriginal people here. There were travellers or traders from Makassar, from the Indonesian archipelago, Malaysian, Malay archipelago, um, other explorers who, who were coming through from other parts. But do you think there's a, a specific quality to that intervention? Well, as you point out, there was some contact before Europeans arrived between Aboriginal people, particularly around the coast, and, and Macassans, um, traders from other parts of, parts of contemporary Indonesia, um, which, which affected people's identities and, and experiences in different ways. Um, but I guess the magnitude of the event of settlement in Australia when, in this country, Europeans came through to Burketown, the first settlement in this part of, part of the world, um, in, in significant numbers and brought tremendous dislocation and violence with them. I mean, when Burketown was first established in the 1860s, early 1860s, within a few years, um, 
not only most of the white population of Burketown then had died of what they call golf fever, but as as far as we can gather, you know, large populations of Aboriginal people also suffered uh, horribly and tremendously to the extent that that um, whole populations of people, language groups, families, uh, died. This was a this was an exceptionally violent. Uh, time in Australia's history, colonial history, where, um, you know, staggering stories of brutality uh, about places here which are recorded in, in, in European documents, as well as in Aboriginal oral histories of what people call wild time. Can you uh, give us an example of one of those stories? Well, I mean, they're, they're stories which, which are kind of spectacular in, the, in, their, in their violence. Uh, Uh, you know, there was a pastoralist here who, who collected human ears and, and nailed them to the wall of his, of his house, reportedly. And this is something that's documented in, a, in an explorer's diary. There was a practice of, of explorers kidnapping Aboriginal women and dragging them along behind them on, on while well, the explorer, the, sorry, the settler was on horseback. They would drag these women behind them, chain them to trees and turn them into domestic servants, slaves, really. You know, staggering stories. And I think contemporary Aboriginal people today see themselves as the survivors of an exceptionally violent uh, encounter um, with non-Aboriginal people, with Europeans and with others who came with them. So. A lot of your, your, your research is tracing the history of that, that relationship, that encounter, to the present. Um, if you could tell us something about how Aboriginal people now are reclaiming some of that land um, that they still have a connection with, and what the role of the anthropologist is in that process. Mm. Well, uh, in Australia, we're, we're fortunate to have, have land rights and native title processes which enable Aboriginal people, uh, particularly in, in regions like the Gulf Country, to make claims for the existence of continuing rights in the land. Um, and in order to do that, it's a very onerous process, both for the claimants and for the researchers that they employ, particularly anthropologists, but also historians and archivists and, and archaeologists uh, to substantiate the, the nature and the content of continuing laws and customs as they relate to land um, since the event of European settlement. So how, how would a group of Aboriginal people go about proving that? Uh, well, they, they would present their, their laws and customs as they're practised and understood today and then relate them as best as they and their, their researchers are able to the system, the society that existed, um, that existed originally when Europeans arrived, notwithstanding change and, mm. and succession. So you as an anthropologist, what's your role in this? How do you uncover this continuity or the stories that can prove that continuity? Well, I work with people uh, across uh, different family groups within, uh, within a, a particular language identity or a particular Aboriginal named group. And uh, we'll look at the way in which people understand their connections today. So it um, can be quite complicated ways of explaining relationships with land inherited through people's grandparents, people's parents. Um, also forms of mythological uh, connection relating to Aboriginal religion, like uh, dreaming stories mm. or... Uh, would, would that be a good, simple definition of dreaming? Uh, well, I think that simple definitions of, of dreaming can, can be misleading in a sense. I mean, I think that Aboriginal religion uh, and, and the dreaming is, is a very complex uh, subject and, and why would we expect it to be anything else but um, in, in this part of, of, of the world today uh, people's lots of Aboriginal people's connections to country 
are still articulated, are still are still understood via this 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 complex uh, experience of the dreaming, which has which has been inherited, been passed through generations into the present. So people will talk about ancestral creatures travelling through the country, stopping at certain places, and doing things. Um, going to another named place, uh, perhaps uh, turning back at a certain place, changing the language that is spoken, moving on into another language territory um, where the, that creature might lie down, might give, give form to some landscape feature or might in other ways continue to, to exist in people's understanding of the world. So. These kinds of stories are part of the information that we use to uh, to understand the nature of continuing laws and customs in order to substantiate the the very real rights and and responsibilities that people maintain in land today. So, and I understand there's different levels of, of rights that Aboriginal people can claim uh, through native title. Uh, native title doesn't mean that they own the land in the sense of owning freehold land. It can, but it doesn't necessarily. It's more about access to country and being able to practice certain things on, on their ancestral land. Is that correct? Well, it takes a number of different forms depending mm. on the colonial experience. But no, essentially, native title can't give anything back to people. People talk about it, we get our land back. And, and in, a, in a practical sense, they do get access back or they get they get um, recognition back but native title as, as as it exists in the law of Australia is about recognizing rights and interests in land types of tenure that people possess and have continued to possess since colonial experience so people aren't, aren't getting given rights uh, but they're having their existing rights recognised. Mm -hmm. um, if people have continuously hunted and fished, um, despite the, the transformations uh, of colonialism, of working in the pastoral industry, um, of having a job in a, in a modern town, if they've continued to practice these customs, which might mean going to a certain place and, and fishing, it might mean uh, undertaking some uh, ceremonial responsibility of um, relating to the dream time, of doing certain practices that might uh, affect the increase of, of fish mm. in, a, in a place, then um, native title uh, allows uh, Australia, the Commonwealth, to recognise and, and that practice. Mm. So we've heard uh, a couple of the rangers and people working here talk about marrying Aboriginal customs and development or jobs or you know, broadly speaking economic development in the region. Um, you've, you've, you've been up here for quite a while, you've done some research here. What's your view on Aboriginal identity on the one hand and economic development or what's, what might be termed sort of Western notions of development on the other? Or if, can it in fact be termed these two, two ways? Well, I think it's an important question. I think that, that uh, Indigenous people, uh, as, as we've discussed, uh, practice traditions which date back many thousands of years, but they also possess identities which, which, uh, which live in the contemporary world in the same way as people in Sydney or people in Manhattan. And, um, Part of those experiences of people today in 2014 um, involve engaging with the broader society and with the with the cash economy and uh, p holding down jobs and positions, careers, um, being anthropologists or land managers or are there a lot of Aboriginal anthropologists actually? There are there are some there are some. <laughs> There are some Aboriginal anthropologists. There are, we've interviewed heritage practitioners here, Aboriginal people. We've interviewed land managers, fire managers, people who, who are engaging with contemporary environmental challenges in the region, challenges of weeds eradication and 
dealing with introduced species, pests, pigs and horses and, and cane toads and, and things. And I think we need to be clear that uh, you can be a traditional person, you can be a, a contemporary Aboriginal person who, who, who enjoys and understands traditions which date back thousands of years in the same area, while still uh, participating in the broader society and still keeping jobs and careers. And, and not only are the, these things not necessarily um, contradictory, but in a lot of respects I think that, that they're complementary. And if you don't have uh, economic development which allows you to, to have opportunities in life, get an education and, and hold down a job and uh, rise to positions of responsibility within your community uh, in its engagement with, with the broader society, then I think it makes it more difficult to maintain those historical, traditional connections that people have in their, in their these places. So in this, this Gulf region um, of outback Australia, where do you see these economic developments coming from? Where, where are the opportunities for Aboriginal people? Well, I think that, that uh, people um, develop op economic opportunities which present themselves in, in mining and in also in environmental management work, the, which is an, is an important um, challenge for, for regions like this, which are environmentally sensitive and also um, in some respects unspoiled in some parts of, of, of the Gulf country. Also industries like pastoralism, Aboriginal people uh, through organisations like the Carpentaria Land Council are growing today to be the biggest holders of pastoral land in the Gulf country. The idea that, that um, Aboriginal land and pastoralism are necessarily at odds with each other. Um, I don't think is, is supported by that fact. There's plenty of pastoral leases which are run today by Aboriginal organisations, Aboriginal people employed in them, and maintaining, in a sense, both parts of, of these identities together. So in these pastoral lands, they have cattle grazing and things like that as part of... Yeah, yeah so people will... Uh, people potentially can work um, on the land, which they might have spiritual and other kinds of historical connections to, while still generating an income and employment for people mm. um, and developing skills. Uh, I don't think the future uh, in places like the Gulf or in other parts of Australia, regional and remote Australia, is necessarily all based on mining, as some people say. There's a whole spread of opportunities for people um, and I think that Aboriginal people today are well placed and, and in many respects enthused about grasping hold of those opportunities to participate in contemporary life and society and economy. Hmm. Great. This might be a bit of a personal question but I'm interested nonetheless. Um, you've been coming here for a couple of years now. How, how do you think your field work, your engagement with the community in the Gulf, with the people here, has, has it changed you? Has it changed your perceptions of the world, your perspectives on the world? I think that you can't... Uh, you know, anthropology involves developing close relationships with people and, and um, I think relationships always change you. And I think coming up here from, from my background in the city, growing up in Canberra and Sydney, it's, it's changed the way I understand this country and what it means to be Australian and to, to uh, inherit and relate to this complicated colonial history. Um, and I guess it's also changed, in some ways, it's changed the way that I see the land. I mean, you ca I don't think you can work closely with people who have such powerful and complex relationships and connections, spiritual connections, um, other kinds of connections with, with country and not reflect on how non-Aboriginal people, mm. um, you know, settler descendant Australians or, or 
people with immigrant, more recent migrant ancestries, how they also relate to the land. I mean, as, a, as an Australian, how I see country is also something that I've been encouraged, I think, to reflect on um, by my engagements with Aboriginal people in, around the Gulf. Great.